أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم كثيرا كثيرا um, This short course inshallah as I said is going to be covering the um, main features of extremism uh, and um, the main issues that those are who are um, like extreme or in their in their views and, and, and deviant to some extent uh, those issues the main issue where they disagree with Ahl al so we will start with Salaf and Salafi. I think most of you know that because we, we talked about it like many times, but nevertheless, it's just a, a quick um, like introduction uh, for the sake of revision for, for everybody who really knows it. And uh, if somebody is haven't like uh, listened to our courses before, at least he can catch up. So the word Salaf means predecessor. So of predecessors. So it is a, a relative word that can be re, can be used to refer to any generation, right? Any generation is Salaf to who who came after them, and is at the same, at the same time Khalaf, which means successors to those who are before them. Okay. However, uh, in the Islamic literature, we we use the word Salaf to refer to a special group and special generations. Uh, special generations uh, who are the three first three generations of Islam, as we know. Uh, this special meaning and respect is because of Sahih Hadith that um, was narrated in Bukhari, Muslim, and other Hadith Sunni books, which in which the Prophet, peace be upon him, says, "The best generations are mine, and the one after one uh, after, and the one after that." So these are three generations. The, in in another riwayah, other narrations, there are actually four, but nevertheless. The most famous and, and acceptable, widely spread and accepted narration is uh, three generations. So, uh, of course, this doesn't necessarily mean that every single person lived in those generations is a better than anybody comes next. That is nonsense, right? Because Abu Jahl, for example, um, and Abu Lahab, they both lived in the first generation. That doesn't mean them or make them good or better or anything. They are not even Muslims, right? Um, and also that doesn't mean that there will be no person in the Khalaf in later generations that will be as good or sometimes even better than others that lived in the early generations. So um, th that hadith is in the majority kind of thing is basically like a general theme, uh, but not to be taken like... Um, like absolutely for every single person or, or so on. Anyway, so th this is what is meant by Salaf. Um, so looking around us now, we can see that Salafi term, the Salafi term has been misunderstood, exploited, misused by a group falsely affiliating themselves to the word Salafi. So, and of course, you see that in every, almost every Muslim world uh, country now. Um, so uh, this, is, this is no secret. They claim that they are the ones who inherited the Salaf. No one else is Salafi but them. No one else is following the Salaf but them. Basically, everybody else is a deviant and does not follow the Salaf. Um, but when we consider carefully what their understanding of the Salaf entails, we find it is we find that it is very shallow and superficial. Their understanding of who is Salafi is determined by minor secondary issues that are subjective and they are, that are subject to disagreements, nothing concrete, all matters of opinions. As we'll see later on, um, there are the, the took issues that are subject to this disagreement that even the Salaf disagreed upon and picked one of those opinions and said, okay, that is the opinion of Salaf generalization, and basically every every everybody who doesn't believe in that uh, or doesn't say the same thing um, is 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 not following the Salaf. For example, or even sometimes we take the the opinions of deviants that lived by the time of the Salaf, like as we said, like the first three generation are not um, is not immune to deviants. There there have been deviants living in those generations as well. And they take that those opinions and basically ignore, ignore the, the the salaf the true salaf way, as as we talked about before in many 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 courses. So, anyway, that's basically like a, a feature of those people. 
so their application of this twisted understanding of the term Salafi and their misconceptions makes only a fraction of the Ummah Salafi. So by that, by, by their definition and by that standard, their standard, the 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 word the word Salafi in in a, in a, if you if you want to refer to or say that the word Salafi means those who follow the Salaf, their narrow-minded and the twisted definition of the term makes them only the the, the people who who uh, follow the Salaf and the entire Ummah, everything, uh, everybody else in the vast majority of the Ummah. Um, are are basically deviant, including the most knowledge, knowledgeable and the most pious scholars, becomes mubtadi'ah in their views. All right, so that's basically just a quick recap about what is Salafi and what is the word Salafi, where it came from, and so on. Now, now let's talk about Salafiya, the emergence of the modern term Salafiya, okay, and the Salafis of this age, of the modern age Salafiya that we talk, we, we we see around us. Um, so, first of all, the term Salafiyya started to appear in Egypt during the Brit Brit British occupation. Uh, during this period, Gamal al-Din al-Afghani, um, who was a, like a revolutionary character and has, has a lot of question mark around, around him, whether he is, was he a real patriot and um, like had good intentions, or whether he is actually was was meant to destroy the Muslim world within. These actually are, are two opposite opinions about the man. Um, and I, you know, everybody who's interested can can read about uh, about his uh, about him and and make up their own opinion. But anyway, uh, so that man Gamal al-Din al-Afghani and uh, Muhammad Abdu. Muhammad Abdu was uh, Sheikh al-Azhar later on. He was his student, so uh, Gamal Muhammad Abdu was uh, Gamal Afghani student, and he he was in, influenced very much by him. Uh, they both led a correction movement in their opinion, okay, that lifted the the slogan or this slogan, the slogan of Salafiya. So they said, okay, Salafiya, we want to go back to Salaf. We are Salafi. This is a Salafiya movement, and we want to go back to the Salaf way and so on uh, to motivate people to follow them. The so during this time. Muhammad Abdu saw widespread of myths and bad innovations among their people. Okay, as will be the case in every generation, everywhere, and every time, people will 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 um, innovate bad stuff and will innovate good stuff. And the scholars will educate people and basically prevent the bad stuff. And with with a self correction, uh, like a feedback loop or, or whatever, basically to 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 correct those and so on. Educate people basically, but anyway, um, the, he he compared between the Muslim situation and the West that got very advanced, while lay people, Muslims, were basically following shams and swindlers who claimed to be Sufi awliya. So, uh, the, the, it it became very, like it became customarily for people to just seek those uh, swindlers and fraud. Who claim to be awliya and they they make people do a, a like a, a weird stuff and bad stuff, uh, and those non-educated people, just lay person and non-educated, like mostly illiterate, even they, they couldn't read or write, um, will basically um, didn't have a proper understanding of of tasawwuf and sufiya and so on. So he didn't like that, and he compared that. He he found that this ignorance in people minds is basically holding them back from advancement which is which is right um the way though the correction way would be to teach them to read and write right but anyway um so uh, but at that time um like the the learned and educated community um in the muslim world like in like countries like egypt uh, uh, syria and, and so on were divided into two groups the first is the first group sees Islam as an obstacle to advancement and wanted to abandon its culture and civilization to join the West, even that even if that means letting go of Islamic principles. They didn't care. Just basically, it's it's basically a call for atheism. Okay, so that that like group of people who educated um, we call we call muthaqaf. So he is educated, but he is not scholar. They are not scholars. Not definitely not scholars of Sharia, and they just got. Um, attracted to the, the the West way of living and so on, and just wanted to, to apply that and and didn't like Islam. They didn't weren't Muslims to start with. Um, 
And the second, the second group co considers that remedying the affairs of Muslims is through bringing them back to the pure Islamic principles, away from the quackery and myths, and through integrating Islam into modern life and looking for ways to coexist with this newcomer civilization. So wh 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 while, for example, um, people were believing in, in jinn and uh, which we should be believing in, Muhammad Abdul, for example, in his tafsir will take this kind of phenomenon and uh, do interpretation about it, like to, to say when something uh, ha weird happened, like a magic or anything like that, he, he will deny that. He'll say, no, that's basically, it, it is uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the um, bacteria, for example, affecting people to do that, you know, some weird stuff like that. Anyway. So basically, there was a, a lack of, of, or not a lack of, it, it was basically more of a tangible way of looking at Islam rather than uh, intangible. The second group was spearheaded, which this was like the second group we're talking about here, was spearheaded by Gamaluddin al Afghani and Muhammad Abdu, as we said. They raised the slogan Salafiyya, and the aim then was to encourage Muslims to renounce sediments and impurities that muddled Muslims' practices so that Muslims may be reattached, reattached to the Salaf way and follow their footsteps. Uh, because everybody loves the Salafi, or Salaf, uh, the Salaf, so everybody loves the Salaf. So if you want to follow the Salaf, you should do those, this and this and this and this and so on. Uh, as a, so basically trying to use that as a way to let people, let, uh, make people let go of their malpractices that got um, like uh, rooted and, and spread in some um, non-educated communities. Uh, the slogan was meant to trigger people's dissatisfaction with the current state of Muslims affairs through an intellectual comparison between the luminous and honorable picture of early Muslims, the Salaf, against the dark and disgraceful situation they are, are, they are now in. So that was the main, uh, the main, the main, main thing, right? The aim. So um, as a result of that, when you, you do that, then the people should and would realize that the only way to get back to the honorable situation of Muslims is through returning back to the proper Salaf way. The uh, correctional movement was gaining momentum on the hands of Al-Afghani and Muhammad Abdu, and then his, after that, uh, Muhammad Abdu's student, Rashid Rida, given the weakness and occupation that was spreading in Muslim countries. So people started to, to really, uh, or the movement started to, to gain traction. Um, so again, it was a correctional movement as a, as a renaissance to revive and awaken the attachment to the Salaf to defend the religion. Again, is the opposite direction that we talked about earlier, those who wanted to let go of any Islamic principles to catch up with the, the West. Okay? So that is the issue here. It is not, again, it is not, Corrections uh, movement, like from a scholarship point of view, for, is not a uh, not a revolution on Al Azhar, for example. It's not a revolution on the uh, on the uh, the Madahib Al Arba, the four Madhabs. It's not a revolution against the um, our scholars, like uh, all over the 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 the, the years, all the generations of scholars, Siyuti, wa Ibn Hajar Al Asqalani. Al Imam al Nawawi and so on and so forth. Nothing again is those. It was just basically trying to get people to reattach to Islam through um, like the slogan of Salafi because it, it, Muslims love Salaf. Okay, and like that, that's like in our in, in, in our nature. So um, to compete against the others who just want them to oh why are you follow why are you doing that religion is is backward uh, you should advance. Re uh, stop forgetting what are they talking about? You're talking about jinn. Who? Uh, where are the jinn? No, there's no jinn. Magic? What jinn? Uh, what magic are you talking about? So this correction movement tried to reinterpret those kind of phenomenon in a way that can be scientifically proven. Okay, so that they they combat those uh, kind of of argument from the other side. Um, okay, so basically, as I said, it was basically a a, a mean of defending. Uh, against atheism, as 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 far as Muhammad Abdu is concerned, I think that was the case. As far as Al Afghani is concerned, I'm not sure, uh, because when you 
read about Al Afghani, you will find that first of all, whether he was born in Afghan or uh, Afghanistan or in in uh, in Iran, is not confirmed. A lot of people, and there is a credible evidence that he was actually born in 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 um, Iran. He is basically Iranian, not even Afghani. Who are, uh, like there is a debate about that. I I, I give you that. Uh, there is a debate, so I don't want to delve much into the intentions of the man, of the man but when you follow his traces nowhere he, any anywhere he settled in and stayed in he will create secret uh, in his uh, communities with the secret agendas and will um will will trigger revolts and and stir stir uh, revolutions and stir issues that uh, at the face of it, he claims to be that as a correction, the way, uh, in a correctional way. But when you see the results of everything that he has done, it was basically the opposite. It was basically destabilizing the Muslim world and the Muslim countries from within. So that's why a lot of people saying he was actually applying, uh, like, or, or or following a a plan, a plot by Shia to start um, destabilizing Sunnah world. I don't know. Allah uh, People saying that. Others saying no, he was a uh, revolutionist and he was a correctionist and whatever. So, as far as Abaghani is concerned, uh, I don't know. Muhammad Abdu, however, was influenced by him dramatically. But Muhammad Abdu's intention clearly was was some, was good. He did a lot of good things, but a lot of bad as well. Um, in terms of of, um, we will see how like how how things develop now. But um, anyway, he is a student. Rashid Rada, who, who even got, like, you know, when you start um, deviating from the right path, at every generation that comes after that, it basically increases the deviation. So Muhammad Abdu, although he was Ahl al-Sunnah for sure, and he is, uh, he is a, like a great scholar, and he was Sheikh al-Azhar and Mufti and all that kind of stuff, and he was very knowledgeable and he had good intention. He had done a lot of good things, but he... Re, like he revolted and or 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 had also some um, issues, bad decisions and wrong decision that um, really really got m like magn amplified after him, especially on the hand of Rashid Rada. Rashid Rashid, Rashid Rada took that and multiplied that by tenfold. Okay. At the same time, during the same period, Wahhabism had spread in Najd and were established in Najd and some areas in, in the Arabian Peninsula. Wahhabism had common de denominator with this correction movement, with the Salafiyya and correction movement and the, the not like the 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 movement to try and get back to the Salaf way. That was in Egypt and uh, uh, Syria and so on, and uh, those other countries, Jordan and so on. Um, so this correction movement had some commonality with the Wahhabis, albeit it was actually a very superficial level. Like you can look at the uh, like at a very high level, superficial level, you can see there might be some commonalities, but in in fact there weren't any actually commonality whatsoever. But this commonality is a fighting bid'ah, myths, fables, and superstition. So this was basically the, the, the common thing between these two movements. So Muhammad Abdu and, 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 this, and the correctional movement there wanted to fight those superstition and, and fables because they have been messed. They see that those issues have been used by the atheists to drive people away from religion, telling them, oh, you believe that um, like al, al Braq, there is a creature called Al Braq. Where is it? You believed in that? Do you do that? And do you, do you believe in this and that? So see what your belief led you to. Now you are being occupied by by the West, who came very became very advanced, and you don't believe in anything of that. That's nonsense. What you are believing, and so on and so forth. The materialist kind kind of of of, of dawa and and um, and argument. Uh, so Muhammad Abdu wanted to to defeat that by basically trying to find scientific interpretation and scientific and tangible um, explanation of those kind of things so people can like stay and 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 stick to 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 the deen. Um, so basically, they are fighting bid'ah and fighting superstitions and so on. On the same time, Wahhabis claim to be 
we are fighting bid'ah. That's basically what I'm saying. And to them, for, for sure, the, the term bid'ah is everything that they don't believe in. So anyway, um, because of that, because of that common theme, um, the the so it, like in case of the Wahhabism, then the 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 slogan of Salafia was an empty slogan. They didn't really carry much weight because, um, like oh, despite all the the problems and the mistakes committed by those the the correctional movement in Egypt and the other countries, and, and like as I said, um, they 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 were still based on solid scientific and scholarship grounds. As you said, Muhammad Abdu was Shaykh al-Azhar. He was a very knowledgeable pe pe person. Rashid Rida was still a scholar um, and, and so on, right? So these were scholarship, scholars, educated, highly, highly educated and highly, highly like um, uh, knowledgeable. Whereas in the other side, those Wahhabis, they don't even know how to read Quran. Some of them, some, some of the shiuch until now. Uh, they they can, don't, don't do Tajweed, cannot do Tajweed, for example. Um, so anyway, so anyway, the, the mere apparent commonality made some some think that this Wahhabism is the same as its correctional movement. Like basically, they start to think, oh, uh, they start to think, yeah, I'm in Egypt, I had this correctional movement, and there is also that movement in uh, in, in Najd and in the uh, Arabian Peninsula. It's called Wahhabism and the also correction movement. So they they thought they are basically the same thing. Some some people, some scholars thought that. Um, and um, Rashid Reda was one of those apparently, and he started a propaganda for Wahhabism. He started like even he he was the first one to call Wahhabism Salafia. So he's basically covered the Wahhabi movement under the Salafia and under the correction Salafi movement. And marketed them as such, and uh, he and others, like other other figures, started printing their books under the label of Salaf. Okay. So suddenly, the word Salafia converted from a slogan of a correctional movement that aimed to encourage people to stick to Islam against atheism to a name used by a group of people who think that they are the only ones among all Muslims who are on the correct way, and that. They are the only custodian, only the only custodian on the understanding of Islam according to the Salaf. Anyone else who do not conform to their own understanding is innovator, is muqtada'. So the, you can see how now, like it started something, but then they, those Wahhabis hijacked the term Salafiyya and hijacked the momentum that Muhammad Abdu and his his school of, school um, of scholars like pushed and gained attraction, so basically they they joined it under the same label and then they hijacked it basically and kicked everything everybody out after that. So basically it became just them. While they didn't have, they weren't even qualified to start with to be like under that under that label. Now, as I said, Muhammad Abdu, there's a little bit of uh, issues about him. You can see here this uh, his handwriting written note by Gamal al-Din al-Afghani, sorry, not Muhammad Abdul, Gamal al-Din al-Afghani, uh, seeking admission to, to the Masonic Lodge. So basically, Gamal al-Din al-Afghani and Muhammad Abdul jo joined and started the Masonic Lodge in the Middle East. All right? Of course, we know the Masonic Lodge, there are a lot of questions about them for sure, and they are secretive and so on and so forth. So basically, that's the, the issue. Muhammad Abdul for sure was, um, again, just, at that time, they were um, claiming to be like modern, like modernist, and want people to to advance and so on and so forth. So probably he just got um, again label. And this is the issue. I think that's where Muhammad Abdul, Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Rahimahullah, um, like where he he the, the, like the problems came from this side is like the secret. Right, the, making secret uh, societies and secretive uh, communities and uh, uh, secretive agendas and that kind of stuff that is not um, like that. That shouldn't be the case. We don't have secrets, okay? They, we don't have groups. We have Muslims. We have Ahl Sunnah. That's it. So no groups. Any any groups. When you start making groups and secretive and and having your own agenda and so on, then you you get out. You stray a little bit, 
out of, of the, the, the proper path. So he thought there's going to be a correctional way. And maybe because of the, the, the situation back then, I don't say, I, I, I like maybe he had his own excuses back then uh, with the occupation and, and like seeing people like a, a very strong uh, atheism. So he had to be strong in the other way around to, like to, 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 to combat that. So maybe it was the circumstances he lived in and he did the best he could. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, yani forgive him and grant, like he, he made ishtihad. Um, if you do ishtihad and you do right, you get uh, two, uh, two um, rewards. If not, then you get one, right? But anyway, um, Muhammad Abdul also, one of the issues is he, he wanted, like, he didn't like the literature, all the literature. He found that there would be like a problem with the way that Al-Azhar was being conducted in terms of education. So he wanted to, to modernize that. And that was the case. You, you always need to upgrade. But when you do something at the beginning, sometimes you take like an extreme action, which doesn't, because you don't know. So maybe you just get extreme action, but then you, you, you see where that is and review your situation and get back to the right a little bit, to the left a little bit until you, you get the, the sweet spot and the right balance, right? So that, that's why, because he was the first one to do that, you wouldn't you wouldn't expect somebody to do something at the first and get it right or like hundred percent right for the first first time, right? So we we talk now having the benefit of the hindsight, right? So basically, we we can now easily say and say, oh, he did that wrong, he did he did this right, but because we saw the consequences, but at his time you don't know the consequences, so you don't know, you don't know what you don't know, right? So anyway. Um, there are a couple of quotes by Muhammad Abdul that I wanted to, to uh, read to you. He is saying, um, there is no, um, like, as I said, despite him being like um, resisting the malpractice, malpractices of um, those who claim to be Sufis and so on, you can see that he actually understand Tasawuf and he actually encourage it. But the proper way of Tasawuf, not the, the, the like the what sometimes what he w was seeing at, the, at at his time. Um, so he is saying, and also he never called that shirk or kufr, right? He said that malpractice that's wrong. We need to get back to the salaf, but he never said that's kufr, shirk, and started killing people like what Wahhabis did. So anyway, he started educating people rather than killing them. That's that's one of the difference between Muhammad Abdul Correctional Movement and Wahhabis. He's saying, إنه لم يوجد في أمة من الأمم من يضاهي الصوفية في علم الأخلاق وتربية النفوس. There is no no group or nothing in 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 any أمة, in any civilization or any nation that come close to Sufi to تصوف and the Sufi in the علم الأخلاق in the الأخلاق and education and discipline. Uh, and that because we the the weakness of this level or the weakness of those of this group. We lost Deen. We lost the Deen because of this weakness. Because this group started to not focus on the on, on the discipline of, of, of nafs and uh, not focus in being zahid in a dunya. The opposite. They started to actually be eager to have dunya. You started to be eager to, to, to have wealth and so on. And basically just keep appearances and make themselves sheikh, sheikhs and so on to get benefit from, from people. So when that happened, we lost Dean. All right. Um, anyway. Now, let's talk about the truth about following Salaf. Um, well, it, it is following Salaf is not merely confined, confined in the literal words. All right. In total and non cynical isolation from the meanings and methods of the Salaf. So you don't just take a word that the Salaf said uh, in, in, without even knowing why that scholar of Salaf said it or based on what or anything and ignore the, the methodology of, the, of, of that person and ignore the meaning and what he was basically preaching all over his life and ignore all that and take this word and say, okay, that's uh, the Salaf. Like this kind of confinement is non-cynical for sure and total, um, total nonsense. 
So um, rather, it's about adherence to the principles and fundamentals that they taught, the Salaf taught their followers, and and to teach them how to reach judgment. So that as we like, I, I'm not sure if everybody here, maybe probably probably not, but um, in in the uh, intro to fiqh course, we we talked at at like um, uh, a level of of depth into the the madhab al arba the the four madhabs and how they reached judgment and how they developed and so on so it it is a methodology it is a way of thinking uh, that is coherent and in line with the sharia law it's basically because the issues that will happen are more than what was and different than what happened 1000 years ago so they were basically teaching them how to reach judgment not the judgments themselves. So following the Salaf is the overarching nature of the of most all Muslims. All of us, basically, all Muslims follow the Salaf. It is not confined for a fringe group who don't even follow the Salaf, the, but follow deviant groups such as al karamiya and Al-Khawarij. So in that sense, Al-Khawarij actually started by the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib. So they were in the Salaf. So they are Salaf. No, they aren't. They are Salaf Talih. They are bad Salaf. Bad examples of Salaf. Not good Salaf that you should be following. Um, so under the Salaf umbrella, even there were numerous scholars who disagreed upon themselves in some principles or, or secondary matters while agreeing on the major fundamentals. So they would, on the scientific principles, they may disagree. But the, the major fundamentals of Islam and, and the Ahl Sunnah fundamentals, they will agree on that. So as they disagreed on the, the secondary matters or the, even the, the scientific principles, no one called the other Muqtada' or out of the right path or anything like that. Right. So uh, Abu Hanifa and the Shafi'i and the Malik and Ahmad, all of them had their own principles, scientific principles as we like elaborated and talked about in the fiqh course, as I said, the intro to fiqh. But uh, Shafi'i never called Abu Hanifa Muqtadi' or uh, any, 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 anything like that, like or disgraced him. Rather, he was calling him the great imam, the greatest imam. He said that anybody in the fiqh comes after Abu Hanifa is basically student of Abu Hanifa. Right? So, anyway. Um, there were almost 90 mujtahid, 85 to 90 mujtahid by Abu Hanifa time, and and like this this generation, Abu Hanifa and uh, before Abu Hanifa and Abu Hanifa and later on Malik and Shafi and so on. There were 90 mujtahid, each with their own madhab, but only four survived and reached us, developed and so on, and advanced. So those 90 mujtahid, nobody, no no one of them said the other is mubtadi, right? And they are all Salaf. Like most of them will be Salaf. A lot of them, not all the 90, but like the first generation of them will be Salaf. At least 30, 40 of them Salaf. So when you say, I'm following the Salaf, I'm Salafi, following the Salaf, which one? You don't know. If you if you picked one of 20 or 30 or 40, why are you saying on like the other, why, why are you claiming the other who followed one of the others is, is Muqtadi? Based on what? What makes you not Muqtadi'a and the others Muqtadi'a? It's, it's uh, the, the, the desire, the arrogance. Therefore, no one can claim that certain opinion in a secondary matter is a madhab of the Salaf, since they themselves disagreed upon it. So there is no madhab of the Salaf. There is nothing called madhab as Salaf, because there is no just one madhab for a Salaf. There is a point, right? So the, the Salafiyya actually, the Salafi and the Salafiyya is not actually the, a madhab. It shouldn't be taken as a madhab. It is a time period, the first three generations. So when you're saying you are Salafi, did you live in the first three generations? No. All right. I'm following the, the Salaf madhab. All right. But there was no Salaf madhab. So what are you following? Oh, I'm following Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Abdul Wahab. Okay, so this is because because there was no one madhab for the salaf. Rather, as we as we as we said, there were many mushtaids. Now let's talk about the characteristics of extremists. This is very important. This is a fruit of this lesson now. Okay, 
want you to, to focus very much. And we are almost there. Is there any questions so far before I move on? All right, no questions. Good. All right, so we find that most of those who call themselves Salafis share a confrontational attitude, okay? And often exhibit the following set of beliefs. They, they believe that the whole world hates Muslims and that they are in a state of war with the entire world all the time, right? They, they believe that it's mandatory to be in a struggle with the entire world that they are always seeking and that they are always seeking revenge. This revenge takes two approaches. The first is killing kafirs, infidels, what they like kafir, like killing the kafir is the first approach, which is mandatory. The second is killing apostates. Now for sure kafirs are those who do not take the testimony of Islam and uh, apostles are everyone who actually take that testimony and make that testimony yashhad an la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammad rasulullah but do not follow the religion in their mind the deen and the religion what they believe to be the religion their own okay so this is a twisted mindset clearly it is a well twisted mindset but unfortunately it attracts many youth who do not know any better and did not take proper islamic education when you raise somebody and, and when you like keep telling them you are under attack. Everybody wants to kill you. Everybody hates you. You are, you are, you are, we are, we are, we are. And then we, we, we have, it's mandatory. You have to, to fight. You have to be struggle, st in a struggle with those kafir. You have to kill the kafir. You have to kill the murtadin, apostates. And so who is kafir? Everybody who doesn't say, Ashhadu an la ilallah, Ashhadu an Muhammad Rasulullah, is kafir, should be killed. Everybody who is, uh, uh, should say, Ashhadu an la ilallah, Ashhadu Muhammad Rasulullah, but do not believe in the same set of beliefs that we do, is also kafir or or murtad. Sorry, I think they I got uh, something happening here. I need to reshare the right. So um, wh when you start basically spreading that kind of of like um, evil thought into youth and raise them this way. What do you expect? How would, how would you expect them to, to treat others that are different than them? Right? The Prophet, peace be upon him, didn't do that. The Sahaba didn't do that. Why are you doing that? Right? If somebody is a kafir, that doesn't necessarily mean that you kill him or fight them. What about trying to exhibit good behavior so that maybe, maybe they find the truth in Islam and they became Muslim? Maybe at least they support your endeavors in spreading uh, like Islam or in in uh, teaching others about Islam. Why are you creating conflicts with no reason? It's nonsense. Anyway, so this twisted mindset seeks to draw the issues of the past and impose them on our day-to-day -day life now, in the modern life even though the, the, or, uh, those issues do not apply. Um, and therefore, you, you find those people hung on appearances, not values, right? You can, they talk about, yeah, SWAC, what we do with the SWAC. Uh, SWAC is, uh, we have to do SWAC. Two, toothbrushes is, is, is not allowed, uh, blah, 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 and so on. Like, it, it's, it's basically trying to, uh, instead of, living within the 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 manhaj and the 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 way that of islam that with 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 the right circumstances like because islam and the quran and the sunnah is applicable in every generation every year in every era and and everywhere so rather than making that feature of islam be apparent they want to confine islam in the first 300 years so basically like we should to the extent, like if if they if they manage to uh, prevent cars and and get back to the horses and camels, they would believe me, they would. The they fight life, basically they consider life is a sin, they have to repent from, and forgetting that it's a blessing from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala who gave life to everything. Life is not bad. You are being given life as a blessing. It is an ni'mah. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is 
fa making favor to, to you that he created you and gave you life. Why do you hate your life? What, why do you hate the life of everybody else? Um, they live in one big conspiracy theory. See, everything is against them, makes them defensive and always against those who are around them. Except from those who share the same short dress for sure and long beard. So, uh, so basically they, they, they measure religion, how, how pious you are and how uh, adherence, adherent to religion you are by how short your dress is and how long your beard is. Um, they are rude, arrogant, as they are unable to realize that there are there are matters that are subject to disagreements, and that they are they are unable to distinguish between what are the matters that are based on certain evidence versus matters that are based on evidence which is subject to interpretation. So, we, what we call dalil qat'i wa dalil unzani qat'i certain affirmative that's something that you cannot basically disagree with. Or, or, or have like interpretation about like, like for example Quran, Kalamullah nobody can say Quran not Kalamullah is basically Jibreel uh, wrote it right nobody can say that it's a Quran, Kalamullah it's a message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Jibreel through the Prophet to, to, the, to the humanity to humanity but uh, that's Qat'i right however um, whether you left your hands in Takbir or not for example, during prayers, that's something subject to interpretation, subject to hadith, and you can disagree with. Me, me disagreement or, other, or somebody disagreeing with them about it, it's, it's not, it shouldn't be a problem. But no, they are arrogant. They say, oh, no, you are wrong. That's basically um, like bid'ah or, or wrong or whatever they, they want to call it. They consider everything bid'ah and therefore existing correction initiatives. They don't abide by any established rules that are salaf that the salaf taught us, as as we said earlier, the salaf, and and every not every not only the salaf, every generation of scholars basically passed on like the manhaj, the way of of living, the way of of making judgments and opinion, and there are established rules, usul al fiqh, what we call usul al fiqh, and they don't even teach that. They, they when they started. Uh, they, they don't know it and they don't apply it whatsoever. So their their judgments are merely based on desires and misunderstanding. They don't even know the language, the, the proper meanings of things and and make, as, I, I mean, uh, for example, إعفاء اللحى إعفاء اللحى in word meaning they, they, they understood it under the the um, like the um, um, Ammiya, what we call Ammiya, which is, is not, the, not the right meaning. It's sometimes, uh, like in the, in the, uh, like in the street language, right? People, like, day to day language is going to be different than actually the, the proper meaning. It just carried different meaning. So um, they understood it as i'fa, meaning in, in, in make your like, like, leave your, your, uh, uh, your beard, uh, basically, like, uh, tall, very tall. That's the word of i'fa, but actually that's not the, the proper meaning. The, the meaning of i'fa is cutting it. So it should be cutting it. And I think there is a question in the group about Hanafi Madhab, uh, what is uh, the, the length, the proper length in Sunnah of, of, uh, uh, of the beard, uh, beard in, in, in Hanafi Madhab, and it's basically a fist. It shouldn't go beyond the fist. So basically, you put your fist and cut anything else. So any, anything fist and below. That is basically Mazhab al-Hanafi. Uh, but within the, the, the fist, um, like length, uh, if it like go that, that, that length. After that and beyond that, and like what we see, the, the, the beard goes all the way to the uh, belly button. That's actually not, not Islam. That's basically like was a, a feature of, of um, Ahlul Kitab back then and non-Muslims. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, was telling the, the Sahaba, don't look like them, cut your beard. Well, uh, cut it, not cut it like, like to the, the end, meaning basically don't make it that long. Right? Don't make that very, very long. Just make it a bit short, short shorter than these people. That's basically the Hadith. But because we don't understand the meanings, they basically make 
poor judgment and wrong judgment, and they think they are following the salaf, they think they are correct, and everybody else is is, is muqtada. In the way, in the same way, they don't have a, a, a usul al fiqh. They don't teach. They don't teach it. When they started the uh, the universities, um, the the Wahhabis universities, they um, what's the problem? Yeah, they didn't. They didn't put that that word that, that topic that subject usul al fiqh. So no other country would would recognize that university because they told them you have to teach the usul al fiqh. This is a, a, a subject, a topic that has to be taught in every university in order for you to be recognized. So they they taught it, but what did they teach? They teach they taught al madhab al zahiri, not the four madhab. No, because if they follow the four madhab, they will like clearly they will. Uh, it will, it will go against everything they say, probably. But anyway, they 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 brought in the madhab al lahiri uh, and the, the literal literal or who who don't take qiyas uh, deduction, right? Um, and 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 started like admitting that or or putting that as a subject in the uh, in in their uh, in their curriculum. But do they follow it? They do not follow it. Even if, even when they make decisions or make uh, like judgment, they don't have any proper uh, methodologies or anything like that. Now, um, the last section, and it's also that's basically the crucial part of today's lesson. There are main issues of disagreement with Ahl Sunnah. Okay, so for sure they have a lot of a lot of issues, a lot of masail and a lot of fatwas and so on that differs from Ahl Sunnah. Okay. But there are some key issues that you can look at and decide or figure figure right away that oh those are not ahl sunnah way. And to the extent they like any group, look, you can basically take this. I'm going to give you a matrix at the end with a 17 point. Take this 17 point, apply it to any group. If they do not follow ahl sunnah way, you can know. Okay, you can you can know right away whether or to the extent that they differ from Ahl Sunnah, okay? So the main issue is basically attributing place to Allah, okay? And, and everything that comes after this is basically the entire corporeal, corporeal, uh, corporealist uh, aqidah, okay? Uh, attributing place to Allah and that Allah is sitting on the, th on the throne and all that kind of things which we talked about in Al-Kharida. Uh, demonize and abuse Ash'ari and Maturidi schools. Once you see that they are doing that, you know right away they are not Ahl Sunnah because Ahl Sunnah are, or Ahl Sunnah is basically Ash'ari, Matridi. Anything else is not Ahl Sunnah. Even when you say Hanbali Madhab, the, the Fudala al Hanabila, they are actually following, like under, like follow the umbrella or under the umbrella of these two Madhabs. So these two Madhabs encompass all the Ahl Sunnah. Uh, prevent from following the four madhab, saying you shouldn't be following the four madhab, should basically uh, take the, the like from the hadith, from al-Bukhari, open al-Bukhari, take the hadith, apply it, that's it. Okay? No, not following madhabs. They prevent from following madhabs. In the same time, you can follow them. So you can follow Ibn Uthaymeen, you can follow Ibn Baz, you can follow al huwaini you can follow Hassan Yaqub or whatever he, the, their names is. All those you can follow. But Abu Hanifa, oh, no, not follow. Following Abu Hanifa is shirk, is wrong, is taqlid. You cannot do that. Are you following Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam or are you following Abu Hanifa? Oh, so it's okay to follow Ibn Baz, but it's not okay to follow Abu Hanifa. Is that what you're telling me? Abu Hanifa is from the Salaf. Abu Hanifa is tabi'i. What are you talking about? Abu Hanifa met Anas ibn Malik, met seven of the of, of Sahaba. Uh, I cannot follow Abu Hanifa, but I should be following Ibn Baz. Weird. Rahmatullah alayhim jami'an. So those who, who died, Allah alayhi, may Allah uh, forgive them. Uh, we have no issue with, with, with them. They meant well, maybe. They, it's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to judge them. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive all of us. Right? We all Muslims will forgive all of us. But what we are doing here is trying to prevent the, the, the bad. Uh, or the wrong ways of affecting our youth and basically escalating to worse and worse and worse. We're trying to get back to the proper 
salaf way right uh, so they will prevent from following prevent people or, or saying it's forbidding to follow the full madhab however some of them nowadays started to pick on this issue and and see that it's actually driving away followers so now they're starting to come as hanbali okay come back oh they are just basically lifting hanbali just as a to mislead people to think they are on hanbali madhab or other madhab uh, and basically start spreading their their fab, like their their about uh, real uh, and so on to to their followers anyway um, they are recklessly daring to make fatwas without being qualified and without any methodology as we said they basically will you'll ask him something he will just say right away that man he's um, one of their scholars uh, Uthman al khamis was asked whether the Prophet's blood is pure or not, or felt. He said, no, it's like us, felt, it's not pure. Imagine, imagine, I just, I, I, I can't even believe that any Muslim would say that. Um, unqualified, he doesn't know what he's talking about, he's just basically casually giving fatwas and casually saying saying stuff like that. Uh, expanding the concept of bid'ah so that the vast majority of Muslims become innovators in religion, mubtadi'ah. Everybody becomes mubtadi'ah except them. Forbid tawassul by the Prophet, peace be upon him, and consider it shirk. Forbid praying. Again, this is an important point because there are some groups who are actually like under the umbrella of Ahl Sunnah, but they prevent this. They, they basically they say that. Maybe they don't say it is shirk, but it's prevented. Then with that matrix in your mind, you can say, oh, basically this group is mostly adherence to Ahl Sunnah, but they are not fully Ahl Sunnah because of this. Okay. Uh, they forbid praying in masjids that have graves and explicitly calling for the demolition. When those Daesh um, get get like um, their power and controlling the uh, those part of Syria and wherever they are controlling now, the first thing they have they, they did was to demolish the masjid with mihrab. Because Albani said mihrab is bid'ah. So they demolished the masjid with mihrab and, and broke the, the mihrab. And they demolished the, the, the grave of Imam al Nawawi. Think about that. Imam al Nawawi, they just went there and, and, and demolished his, his grave. Um, so you can see this, the, this is a, the kind of mindset that uh, the Muslim Ummah Muslim have to deal with. Um, they consider it shirk to seek blessings by touching things that belong to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and righteous awliya. Forbid celebration of the Prophet's mawlid, peace be upon him. Forbid traveling to visit the Prophet, peace be upon him, and grave of righteous. Accuse anyone who made dua by the Prophet's status as uh, of shirk. So they accuse of shirk anybody who basically do dua by the Prophet's gah and the status and so on. Taraji bin Dami alayhi salatu wasalam. Tawassul bi'a. We said tawassul here is more of taraji, which are most or less like similar to, to some extent. By the way, every single point of these, we're going to talk about it in detail. The, the evidence of it, why it is allowed and should be done and no problem, and um, why what they are saying. So so basically you can rebut anything, any any issue uh, like being raised about those about those things. Um, they also rule that the Prophet's parents, peace be upon him, are in hell. And keep raising this issue over and over again. Make it complete khutbah, sometimes make complete khutbah in Jum'ah about it. One of the, like their khatib in Jum'ah, Imam will go to the, will get up to the member just to tell the people how the Prophet's parents are in, in, in hellfire. Why? Like, why are you saying that? What, what benefit does it benefit me? Right, even if it is opinion, even if it is your opinion, and by the way, it is a wrong opinion. Prophet's uh, parents, peace be upon him, are in Jannah by the Quran. Forget about they, they basically use a, a weak hadith to do to, to refer to this issue or, or misinterpret some hadith, but it is in the Quran. Right? Um, so I don't know what, and they call themselves Ahl al Hadith. I don't know in what sense, in the sense that uh, we follow hadith, not the Quran, even if the hadith is wrong or right, or even if I misunderstood the hadith, it's uh, super weird. But anyway, even if, if, even if we say that there is an opinion about it and like 
some scholars said the Prophet's parents in hellfire. They are not in, the, in, in Jannah. They made a mistake. Okay. Is this an issue of importance that you keep bringing it up and up again to talk it about it and, and basically raise and, and, I mean, why would you do that? Don't you think that would like upset the Prophet peace be upon him? Don't you think that something, I mean, when you meet the Prophet peace be upon him and you say, Ya, ya Allah, um, uh, uh, you, you, you pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that um, you drink from the Prophet's hand the sharba that you don't become thirsty after it at all and you go to Jannah. So by the, the, the basin of the Prophet, the Hawd, you meet the Prophet by the Hawd and he basically lift his, his hand, the Sharifa, and basically uh, you drink from his hands. When that happens, don't you think the Prophet will ask you, why did you keep saying that my parents are in hellfire? Why did you bring, why do you keep bringing that up? Why is it an issue? It's not a matter of principle, it's nothing. What, what does, what, what are the implications of that in, in, in our life, in, in Ummah, in Al-Fiqh, in anything? Nothing. So why? why? It's it just the hate. It's the hate. All right? So denying any sort of realization of the dead. So basically the dead don't realize anything and that they don't feel anything and they don't know or feel when someone visits them. Again, that's basically one of their important, important um, like belief, set of beliefs, because if you talk to a dead person, then you are kafir, you are mushrik. That's basically the, the thing here, right? Denying making plenty of askar and awrad. If you have a, like askar and awrad and you are keeping them and you are setting some time to do them every day and, and you're doing plenty of that, you will say, oh, that's bid'ah. Why are you doing that? So, I mean, super weird. Making the ibadah bid'ah. Like, like even ibadah, making it bid'ah. Um, consider sibha bid'ah. The sibha, you know, the sibha we, that we count askar on, they consider it bid'ah. That was a case like a few years, many years ago, a couple of dec decades ago now, some of them start to learn that actually, no, there are some hadith because they, they relied on a weak hadith or, or there was a hadith, but that hadith was a bid'ah, uh, sorry, was a, was a da'if, weak hadith. So said, oh, it is wrong. Okay. It is, hadith is, is da'if. So if the hadith is da'if, does that mean the sibha is, 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 is not allowed? No. But anyway, after that, when scholars uh, like refuted this position of Al Albani, he was Al Albani who said that initially. When they refuted that and brought up many, many, many ahadith sahiha about Sahaba and Ummahat al Mu'minin doing sibha, they started to, some of them started to realize they made a mistake and basically don't talk about it. But nevertheless, it is one of the issues that some of them will, will basically uh, highlight as a main issue. Uh, they focus on appearances and seek ibadah through clothes. Okay, so basically, I'm doing ibadah by wearing the, the short dress, and that's it. Um, this is also an important one. is the last one with the 17 point. Running before crawling. And like, basically, they are not qualified, as we said, and they will be the sheikh, and, and he doesn't even know what, what, what he's talking about. Uh, Al-Albani, there is a recording, his own voice taking pride that he didn't have a sheikh and he taught himself through books and he never had a sheikh and taking pr pride of that. Um, and also the inability to, to distinguish between preach and teach, preacher and scholar. So there is a, a preaching, somebody who may have, we may know something and he, he communicate that and, and preaching it and uh, um, reminding others and between a scholar. So don't bring a preacher, as a scholar, preacher doesn't do fatwas. Preacher doesn't understand everything in Sharia. They are not scholars, okay? But they don't distinguish between that. So anyway, these are the 17 um, points that we want to talk about. And uh, this is a matrix that I, uh, like, I collated, like based on those 17 points I, I, we, we talked about. So these are here, every single point of those, what we talked about. Ahl Sunnah, do they do that? No, they don't. Wahhabis, do they do that? Yes. Now put here any, any group that you want to find out whether they, Ahl Sunnah, they are Ahl Sunnah or not. Do they do that? 
no, no, yes, no, yes. And then you can even calculate like a percentage how, to what extent this group uh, conform with Ahl al-Sunnah way. Okay? Um, so uh, this takes us to the end of this lesson, today's lesson. Um,